So my name is Ricky Brown, osteopath, naturopath, sports therapist, strength and conditioning coach, blah, 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 blah. Um, I came to Guernsey just over two and a half years ago to uh, work as an osteopath within primary healthcare. And in the, within the space of two years, I realized that the primary healthcare setting did not allow me really to provide the comprehensive service that I needed in order to address some of the most common aches and pains and symptoms that were walking into my clinic. Um, in that time-restricted environment, I found that I was only a bit able to provide what I'd describe as a reductionist approach to musculoskeletal health care. Um, it's been alluded to earlier that a lot of aches and pains that we see are just an end product, they are symptoms of deeper um, issues that have been you know, kind of compounded over time. So many of the people that I would treat had you know, chronic comorbidities. Um, and their aches and pains were often a manifestation of you know, psychological unwellness, you know, manifesting through the musculoskeletal system. Tension, stress, anxiety, low mood. Um, so for me to really simply address the symptom, it would be using the analogy of you know, sat in a boat with a hole in and doing this with a bucket. I really needed to get to the hole, patch it up, and I couldn't do that within the, within the um, setting that I was in. So I left there and you know, took a risk and thought to myself, I need to be able to provide a com more comprehensive and effective um, modus operandi for patients. And that's when I started to look around for, um, well, for somebody who could complement what I do with uh, the same passion um, and a skill set that would you know, enhance my ability to heal people. And I, when I say heal, I really mean heal. Um, and that's how I came across Mr. Daniel White, who was out in the community um, doing fantastic talks on such topics as sleep and nutrition. And that is how our relationship started. And since then, I haven't looked back. It has been a massive risk as a, as a healthcare practitioner to go out and you know, kind of forego the predictable wage of the primary care setting. But at the same time, I am much happier as a practitioner and I'm providing a much more effective service. So Ricky Brown, osteopath and exercise therapist. Hi guys, um, so obviously I'm Daniel White, nutritionist and health coach as the tagline goes. And when my journey really began um, with, with self-exploration with my health journey. So when I was 18, 19 years old, um, I was about the same weight in, in stone. I was, um, I was deeply anxious and deeply depressed. I spent a lot of time at university. I, I studied an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's in psychology, um, during which I, I really un began at least to unravel my own mind. Quite interesting, actually, because I went on to study a master's in, in nutrition and behavior. Maybe that was a result of, of my anxiety, my depression, and my eating disorder at the time. Quite funny, though, in three years doing a, a BSc psychology degree, we never once uh, mentioned nutrition. And, and one part of my talk that I'm going to get across today, hopefully, is the, the interconnectedness of the foods that we eat and, and the mood and the behaviors that we express. So I came back from university about 14 months, 14 months ago now. Freshly qualified and ready to change the world. I enlisted some clients. I got, got them in a room with me. I, I spoke at them like this, a thousand miles an hour, and told them everything they needed to eat so it would help their health. Thankfully, I did go back and speak a little bit slower to those participants the next time. But I felt that I was largely ineffective. I, I had an understanding of the mind, because that's really what you gain from a BSc in psychology. But I didn't have um, many tools in my toolbox to address what I was seeing in my clients. You know, I was helping them with diet, I was helping them with nutrition, and this would go great for maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks. Some people you know, just picked it up and ran with it, and I never saw them again. Thankfully, they did pay me, though. But then I would have the odd client that you know, would fall off the wagon, and I would start to spend more time with these clients. And over a couple of sessions, when we got out of talking about nutrition, because eventually, when you talk about nutrition, there's only so many things you can really talk about. It's about putting it into action. But afterwards, I started to see that a lot of my clients were highly stressed. A lot of them didn't move that often. A lot of them, like myself at the time, had self-limiting beliefs and a mindset that was not allowing them to put their thoughts and their feelings into action. 
So I felt largely unequipped to deal with the whole person. Because what I understood, not sadly through my MSc studies, but through my, my outdoor studies and, and my experience of life, is that we have to address the person as a whole. And this is when Ricky came knocking on my door and he said, yo, dude, <laughs> Sir. I, I, I've already referred you 10 clients. Are you going to refer me any? <laughs> No, but me and Ricky did start to make a large change to people's lives as a whole before we even came together to develop what we now call the 31-Day Health Transformation Programme. We've seen a real gap in the market, and it's not just here in Guernsey, it's across the world. There are not holistic, and this word gets, gets thrown around a lot, integrated holistic services or interventions through which one person can come to see a practitioner or a group of practitioners and be addressed in a whole. It's very difficult for me to sit down with one individual, you know, charge them £65 per hour and then signpost them to the next individual who's going to charge them the same or even more. So for us, it was about creating a community of people through which we could really begin to, to spark a change from underneath. Yep, and hence the 31 Day Health Transformation was, uh, was born. And just to add to that, when I'd uh, foregone primary health care and I was in the void, not knowing what to do. There was a, an initiative, the end of, 2000, end of last year, okay, uh, from the Committee of, uh, for Health and Social Care. And they released a set of proposals with the aim of transforming the health and care services in the Bailiwick of Guernsey. And this was called a Partnership of Purpose. Who's heard of that? Yeah. And some of the key aims involved in this Partnership of Purpose were a focus on preventative medicine, preventative health services. Um, Patient-centred care, so where patients or people, I should say, not patients, are valued, listened to, respected, and are heavily involved in their own health care. Um, effective community care, so hubs within the community where well-being and health could be accessed. Um, and with that, you know, effective signposting from you know, the, the well-established primary health care setting to these community-based well-being care initiatives. And recognising the value of public, private and third sector organisations and ensuring people can access the right providers. And at that time, I was thinking, how can I practice in accordance with these proposals, but also, you know, really provide um, effective health care um, in the context of musculoskeletal health? Um, and that's when, you know, we sat down about six months ago, knocked heads, and we came up with five fundamental determinants of robust health, contentment, happiness, vitality, sexiness, whatever you want to call it, stress resilience, exercise and movement, sleep, nutrition, and the mindset. And within our 31 days, we allow you to explore um, and encourage you, motivate you to, you know, Examine, introspection, um, look inside, um, raise awareness of yourselves and with some evidence-based and some very practical tips, habits and tools, we are able to make, you know, literally a transformative experience occur. So what is it about these key characteristics? Well, I'll get started with nutrition. So there is a growing consensus, um, thankfully, that, you know, we are not just calories and food is not just calories and in fact um, the foods that we eat many of us enjoying them now by the looks of things contain nutrients and as Sophie alluded to in her previous talk which by the way was absolutely excellent proteins carbohydrates fats these are different macro molecules that our body uses and is unnecessary for biological processes calories don't do that we also need minerals vitamins and phytonutrients but one and probably the most pertinent missing part of this story is that we are not only what we eat, but we are actually fundamentally, on an individual level, what we ourselves can digest. What do I mean by this? You know, if I eat chocolate, I'm going to get fat. If I eat vegetables, I'm going to get thin. But that may not be the case. You see, in our modern society, we eat many processed foods. And on top of that, many of the actual real and natural foods that we eat, we process in ways that make them very difficult for us to digest. This is why fad diets don't work for everybody, because everybody has a very different bio-individual digestion. Now, when we consume foods which are difficult for our body to digest, we experience what are called adverse food reactions. Now, 
There are three things about these adverse food reactions. Firstly, they damage our digestive system. This is very simplified, by the way. They disrupt our gut microbiome. We'll get on to talking a little bit about that in a second. And they cause an imbalance in the beneficial and harmful bacteria that reside in our digestive tract. So what, what is important about this, this microbiome, this digestive tract, and, and you know, what is so terrible about these adverse food reactions that we have? First of all, well, what is our microbiome? I can see most people in their head room kind of turning their heads. Well, we are, we are, this might come as a shock to some of you, we are actually in a symbiotic relationship. This means a two-way relationship between ourselves, human, host, and the billions and trillions of bacteria that live inside of us. We provide them a home, and they carry out many, many important functions that we need to survive. So some of these, for example, at the top, regulating our hormones and our neurotransmitters. You know, in psychology, we never mentioned food once. We certainly didn't mention digestion. But we now know that our digestion and our microbiota regulate our hormones and our neurotransmitters. This has a large effect on, on not only our physical health, but also on our mood and our behavior as well. This is why comorbidities such as IBS and anxiety, for example, very, very often come together. These bacteria are also really important for helping us to digest and absorb the nutrients from the beautiful food that we're all eating now. And they also actually help us to produce many vitamins and other nutrients that we need. We need to produce energy, we need to repair our cells, our muscles, and many other functions. Most importantly though, probably most importantly, definitely most importantly, our digestive tract and our microbiome is the gateway to our immune system. And right at the bottom here in red, this is one important point that I want to draw home. Our microbiota is capable of regulating our body's inflammatory immune response. Just bear that in mind for a second. Just want you to take a little look at the board. Unfortunately, something's happened with the slide there, so you can't see the list of about 30 or 40 different health conditions that many of us will be able to resonate with, either on a personal level, you know, have seen family and friends go through these sorts of things. What do we know about all of these health conditions, whether it's joint pain, whether it's skin issues, whether it's diabetes, obesity, depression, anxiety? All of these things have an underlying connection to an increased or heightened inflammatory response, which is very interesting when we know that at least some elements of inflammation within our body could be modulated by our gut bacteria and therefore uh, kind of the health of our digestion. So what are we going to do about that? Well, this is something that we do with our, with our clients on our 31-day health transformation program. We, we put them through what we call an elimination diet. Now, I don't like the word elimination because it suggests uh, a kind of reduction or forgoing something. It's quite a scary, scary word. I prefer to call it the illumination diet. So what does it do? Well, well firstly, it's really important because it helps us to reduce inflammation and supports our gut. So we remove what we call possibly harmful foods from our diet for 21 days. This allows our immune system a blank slate, reduces inflammation, helps to promote more awareness of what foods are doing to our body. For the first time in our lives, we might actually start to make a, a realization that some of the foods we were eating might have been contributing towards some of our most grievous health concerns. What we do after this 21-day period is we reintroduce the foods. It's really quite a simple process. People, a lot of people get scared, you know, well, what can I eat, you know, oh, my, my 10 favorite foods aren't on the list. Well, I can tell you now there, there's a list of, of foods that we avoid, and there's tons of lists of foods that are available to us. You know, with a bit of support, with the community, sharing recipes, making your food bright and exciting, it's really, really not that difficult. Is clicker working or not? Oh, baby. Yeah. Clicker died. Click, click. <laughs> okay. Just freestyle a little bit now. So what else did this elimination diet process allow us to do? It allows us to heal and strengthen our digestive system, which, as we've just mentioned, is so, so important in terms of our overall general health. It allows us, really, for the first time in our entire lives, to be sure that the diet that we're eating for ourselves as an individual is promoting health and is not doing the opposite which is causing uh, risk, at least, risk or progression of disease. Can we get the slides fixed at all? Awesome coming, one second. Brilliant, so what I will say is that for a long time, um, I suffered with chronic eczema. I had eczema all over my body. Um, I was also extremely anxious, and, and as I mentioned in my, in my other talk, somewhat depressed. Um, and when I went through my first illumination diet, it was, it was profound. I suddenly made a connection that, you know, some of, I won't name certain foods, but, well, perhaps gluten, perhaps dairy, 
and perhaps for me sugar, were some things that were causing an aggravation of my immune system and increase in inflammation, and as a result, the progress of my eczema. I'm, I'm quite happy to say that I don't suffer from eczema at all anymore these days after um, engaging in this process and, and further ones. All right. So, the, sorry about the slides here. The illumination diet is really important because it reduces uh, physical stress on our body, because essentially our immune system is hyperactive if we are consuming foods that we as an individual, individual to each and every one of us, are not capable of digesting. And that brings us nicely onto the subject of stress, which has been getting a bit of a bashing today, hasn't it? Whoa, get rid of stress. Whoa, we don't want that. Suppress it. Avoid it. But that's what it is. It's really something that arises when something you care about is at stake. So, you know, let me summarise by saying, uh, no stress, no meaning. Stre a stressless life is a meaningless life. And it's simply a combination of our responses to an ever-changing and demanding environment. So we're never going to avoid it. Um, and I think it's really important that our perception of stress can change. And when that changes, so does our physiology. So we've talked about the fight or flight, but it, it gets a bit deeper than that. It gets a bit more complex. Um, you know, we can break the fight or flight response down into threat and challenge. Um, we can go on to tend and befriend. There are different physiological states depending on how we contextualize the stimuli which we're faced with. So during the course, you'll be introduced to different concepts and habits and you know, techniques that will allow you to be able to see things more as a challenge. When we see things as a challenge, we release different hormones. Okay? Um, and those hormones uh, tend to be more conducive to growth, to learning, okay? to um, resilience and development, as opposed to threat. Even your circulation will change if you are seeing something more as a challenge than a threat. So for instance, as a threat, your circulation tends to move away from the periphery with a challenge circulation tends to go to the periphery to prepare you for action because that's what stress really does. It prepares you for action. Now, it's really important, therefore, to be aware of your stress mindset. Okay? Are you a person that, you know, does it exhaust you? Does it paralyze you? How do you talk and think about stress? Is it always in a negative light? You know, because once you start to embrace it as something that is preparing you for action um, in, in light of something you care about, it can actually become very exciting as opposed to, <gasps> got to suppress it. And even in states of you know, anxiety, if we can shift that perception into excitement, amazing things happen. So during the course, you will learn how to transform anxiety into excitement and avoidance into performance just by practicing very simple contextual um, habits and behaviors. Um, so yeah, that's what it is. It's just preparing us for action. So embrace it. The heartbeat, you know, the dilated pupils, the sweating, okay, the jitters. It's getting you ready for something you care about. And you know, it's preparing us for physical action, not just going out there and indulging in rubbish food smoking cigarettes, and drinking alcohol. So that moves us on to next, the third component, which is exercise and movement. Yes? You might call it activity, or whatever you want to call it. Exercise, again, gets a bashing nowadays, doesn't it? Because of the perceptions that we have in our minds, what exercise is. It's in the gym. It's hard work. It's adverse. You know, I, I'm not very good at that. There's no eff efficacy for me. I, you know. But at the end of the day, as long as you are moving with a sense of purpose of protecting your health and enhancing your health, it can be whatever. If the physical activity you can call, you know, it can be whatever it is. Um, and ultimately, exercise or movement is nature's perfect buffer of stress. Now, take a look there. What's that? What's she doing? She's, perf she's performing activity. 
and exercise and activity are often two different things. I often get, when I, in a clinic, I would ask people, do you do any physical exercise? And there'd be a pause, and then, yes, I, yes, I do the gardening, and I, I walk the dog, and I walk to work. But yes, these are activities, but are they done with the purpose of going out there, and you know, are they structured and purposeful with the intent of enhancing, protecting, and improving our health? So we must be able to differentiate between activity and exercise. And often, as human beings, we deceive ourselves. And this, this perception of confirmation bias, where we will filter through our own mindset what we want to hear for ourselves. We want to protect our ego. So ultimately, we'll convince ourselves. We'll over-report. It's very established. People over-report with activity, under-report with eating. Okay? So it's really important to get away or, or, or you know, get out of your own way and, and self-appraise, as Dan alluded to earlier. Um, and we, do, we teach this. We, we bring this to the table. And we, put, we create a sense of accountability through our community and through my passion, which often spills over into militant discipline. <laughs> um, or really talks. trying. There's a few transformers in the room. Put your hands up, please. You know, I am passionate. And it right, Ricky, you Ricky, I've got to break you there. Breaking oh. news, breaking news. I've got to cut you off, Rick. We've, we've been told something that we've now got to share live at this conference. You see, scientists have discovered a new revolutionary treatment that helps you to live longer. It enhances your memory and makes you more attractive. Ooh. Keeps you slim and, and lowers those nasty food cravings. It protects you from cancer, dementia, wards off the cold and the flu. Lowers your risks of heart attacks, stroke and even diabetes. Better yet, you'll feel happier, less depressed, and less anxious. Oh, it's not a new invention, it is sleep. It's something that, as human beings, we've been engaging in every single day for millennia. Now, the slides have messed up again, I'm afraid to say, but we know through modern research that sleep is linked to all areas of our health. We consider exercise, nutrition to be, you know, the pillars of health, where sleep should be considered the foundation that rests under all of these because it affects our cardiometabolic health, our heart health, our mental health, our cognition, our memory, our immune system, the levels of inflammation that we've been harping on about for the last 20 minutes. All of these things are affected by our sleep. Most importantly, and probably scariest, is that key determinant of our longevity is sleep. There's a direct correlation between time spent asleep and length of lifespan. Scary stuff, isn't it, guys? Well, thankfully, you know, we know that the habits the skills and the best practices that you can all use to improve your sleep can be taught and shared for free. So in keeping with the, the uh, ethos of our Body and Mind conference this morning and empowering you guys, I would like to just quickly share three of my uh, favourite or most important, three of the most important tips that I consider for your sleep. The first is morning light. Now, you know, we all want a good night's sleep and many times we wake up in the morning thinking, God, I need to go to bed earlier tomorrow night. Well, we can start to take those steps and put the groundwork in for a good night's sleep the following night as soon as we wake up in the morning. See, morning sunlight, just about 15 minutes of it is the magical amount, is what sets our circadian rhythm, our biological clock. It sends a, a message deep to the super chiropractic nucleus in our brain that tells us... Chiasmic. <laughs> that one. That tells us it's morning. And, you know, our bodies are very sophisticated organs. They've been operating for, well, humans have been for much longer than us individuals have been here. Um, and our brain knows that when you see sunlight in the morning, it, it tends to mean that about 14, 15, 16 hours later, depending on the time and season of the year, um, it's, it's darkness. So morning light is absolutely fundamental in order to get a good night's sleep the next. Now, darkness is the next. Mimicking natural darkness. You see, until about 140 years ago, we, we didn't have an artificial source of light. We had candles, but they don't produce quite the same effect on our, on our health as these bright lights do. You know, it was the event of the light bulb. I think I read a piece of research the other day. We've lost 25% of our sleep time collectively since the event of the light bulb. See, darkness is a natural environmental stimulus for the production of melatonin, which is our, key, uh, our brain's key sleep hormone. So what I'm saying to you guys is turn down the lights in the evenings. You know, blue light gets a lot of bad press, for example, the blue lights on my phone, but really it's all light. You know, we live in our homes, we have these turning knobs on the walls that we never turn down. We have candles in our homes, candle, light, the tribe, the fire that we experience from a millennia does not have quite the same effect as all these bright artificial lights around us. So if you can do two things tonight, well, one tomorrow morning, start with the morning light and end by trying to mimic darkness. 
Now, both of these kind of th th feed into my third tip, which is regularity. Because for millennia, you know, we woke with the, with the sun rising and the increase in temperature, and we went to bed <coughs> in the evening when things got colder. The stars came out, we started to gaze, and there was darkness. These days, we don't keep much regularity in our life. You know, we have this thing called social jet lag at the weekends where we think it's okay to lie in bed until 10 or 11 because we're so exhausted. And this could actually be contributing towards the problem. So try and keep your sleep and waking time consistent and create routines that signal to your body it's bedtime. You know, why do we all sleep so well as children? Because we had bedtime routines which our brain recognises as patterns that allow us to get a better night's sleep. What are your values? The principles, standards, qualities you consider important. Things that give meaning to your life. There's a few there, the, the list does go on. But, hands up please, give me some values. Anybody have any? I hope Ch so. Changing the world. Changing helping the every world. single person in this okay. room to Anybody live a healthier else? life. Anybody else? Any values in the room? Hugs. Hugs. <laughs> yeah. Love. Okay. Kids? Family? Grandchildren. Yeah. yeah. Any more? Give me some love, people. Think of others, not thyself. Yep. Zeph, you got any values? Tell me one. Finding meaning. Finding meaning. Like that. Okay. Companionship. Yes. Okay. So, what, how can we live in accordance with our values without a good baseline of health? It's very difficult, isn't it? How can we be selfless? How can we have meaning? How can we be you know, role models for our family? How can we be somebody who goes out there and helps our community? We need a good baseline of health. So on the, on the 31 Day Programme, we align your values, your personal values, because you all have them, with your health goals and aspirations. Because we need a compelling narrative to take part in some of these behaviours. And, and, and a subject that hasn't been touched on because we often presume that we can just go out and do these things. We need motivation. We need a compelling reason to take part, not just in our programme, but in, in life. We need a compelling reason to get out of bed. Okay? And this is often you know, influenced by our values, and we all have them. So by firstly identifying your personal values, you can start to see how important your health or enhancing your health and happiness is to that. With that platform, you can then create a really positive affirmation, a really strong positive affirmation. And that is something that is like a compass. It will guide you forward. And it will help you say no. It will help you become more resilient. It will help you succeed and stay on the path that you wish to be. Because we spend a lot of our time being reactive and just reacting to the environment around us. You know, as, as, nat as humans, we are naturally altruistic. And we, social acceptance is a massive part of our daily life. And so with that, we often think about other people and we react to what's going on around us in order to be accepted socially. Instead of actually you know, reverting back to our values, first of all. And I think that's where, really, health and happiness starts, is by highlighting your values and creating an affirmation that really involves your health and understands how important health is to living in accordance with them. So we're now onto the subject of mindset. And if I'm to leave you with something today, I would say, before you embark upon a new habit, health enhancing habit, am I there? Am I there? Write down your values. Take a few minutes. And then take 10 minutes to write down why it is important to be healthy in order to live in accordance with them. Okay? And another one. It only takes 10 minutes of aerobic exercise to feel really good about yourself and confident. Okay, that could be a cliff walk. Also, lower muscle mass and muscle strength are both associated with a higher risk of death in older adults. Okay, so what does that say? Apply a little bit of resistance to your muscles if you want to live a robust life. Okay, and instigation cues. Make it easy on yourself. Engineer your environment. We can all have the best, the most willpower and motivation in the world. But without an environment that's conducive to healthy decisions, it's often very difficult. Put your gym gear by the front door before you leave for work. 
But when the, when the TV commercials come on, get up, do a few gentle squats. You know? Um, it's very simple. Your environment will govern your health. And, you know, this is something that's been alluded to through numerous throughout talks um, with the blue zones. All these blue zones throughout the world, you know, whether it's Sardinia, Costa Rica, uh, Okinawa, and Japan, these, 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 these environments where these people are living and thriving into their 80s and 90s and beyond, their environments are so conducive to healthy behavior, whether it's the terrain, whether it's the foods they eat, whether it's stairs in their houses. You know, so ultimately, please don't neglect your environment. And just a few quick statistics we want to drop because we are alluding to the fact that we are about 10 minutes over our time. Um, you know, talking about values, is children, is the future of our nation, our societies a value to you? Because one in three children, uh, the National Office of Statistics have told us, are now overweight at the age of year six. Or perhaps, you know, it's the environment that you care a lot about because healthier people who make better choices make better choices on behalf of everybody for the environment and the world in which we live. Community is absolutely foundational to us. You know, we have a group of what we call uh, transformers who have taken part in our previous programs and now form this really strong community because, like Ricky said, it really is about our environment. You know, if we can't rub shoulders with people that are on the same mission as us, don't get me wrong, we all have different individual health goals, but if we can't collectively come together and beat the drum and be around people who make similar decisions to us, who spur us on, who motivate us, then it becomes a lot, lot more difficult. Um, you know, you might have heard all of this before that we've had to say today, you know, sleep's important, so is nutrition, exercise, movement. You might be yawning by now because we've been on the stage for quite a long time. Um, but this is just one real world example. So our last group of participants um, on our 31 day health transformation program, we asked them to do um, a pre and post uh, validated health questionnaire in three weeks of undergoing the elimination diet and being coached by Ricky and myself around these areas of movement, stress, resilience, mindset and exercise they managed to reduce their average self-reported symptoms by 67%. It's absolutely incredible. Joint pain, IBS, low mood, skin disorders, fatigue, yes, acid reflux, discharges from pain clinic. In the space of three weeks of proactive introspection and healthy behavior, that is what can happen. And we have a little saying, you know, and why we do this is, is obviously to, you know, promote our course. But at the end of the day, each person that we transform reverberates out into the community. And we hope that we can create, you know, a, a global consciousness around these areas of health and lifestyle and how particularly important they are. And we have this wonderful saying, it's on the t-shirts we're wearing now, and it is transformed, transformed people, transform people. people. Ladies so, and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening to us.